when you're doing the uh, the pollination work is the first few days of is the first few days of um, hot weather for spring, which means all the reptiles are coming out, <laughs> and so um, you have the occasional heart starter with um, tiger snakes, which are one of the world's most sort of few venomous snakes, and which are also renowned for being quite an aggressive thing. And I've uh, you know I've almost stood on a pair of uh, copulating tiger snakes about an hour and a half from the nearest hospital. That was a <laughs> bit of a Wow. Um, but um, one of the good things about working in, you know, places like Western Australia is that, um, you know, you can you can camp kind of freely and you just chuck your, um, well, we all use swags, which is, you know, like a mattress with a canvas sack kind of thing and okay. go have a campfire and you just jump, off, jump in the car and off you go and you know, it's sort of hassle-free camping and lots of really beautiful national parks to do it in. And, you know, I was privileged enough that these drake here are kerf over about a um, north-south. It's about 700 kilometres and a similar distance east-west. So the work sort of takes you right out to the edge of the arid zone, right down to the real sort of wet forests in the southwest and... <laughs> Sort of spent three months of the year on the road, pretty much just living out of the car, camping and doing field work. So, yep. um, you know, for a person who really loves their field biology, it was a you know a pretty amazing experience from that point of view. One of the things that um, has been a, a, a message to me about about uh, working in this field um, is, is more of a sociological message. I think that um, there were early reports in the, um, uh, around 1980, of communication between trees, and um, these uh, got labeled as talking trees. Um, the experiments, um, had problems, as do all experiments, um, and I think that uh, the field as a whole evaluated um, these experiments um, and uh, decided that um, they'd been debunked and therefore that the phenomenon of, of volatile communication between plants wasn't occurring, and that uh, made um, acceptance of this work um, far more difficult. Um, it was as if we had already decided that we'd considered this phenomenon, couldn't find evidence for it, debunked it, and um, it didn't occur. And, and, and so um, gaining acceptance um, of this work has been a lot more difficult based on this uh, sort of sociological history, and, and that has been pretty challenging um, working in this field. Well, we had we thought we'd do another a third field site. Um, my field assistant and I, and we went out and we started to work on it, but we ended up getting you know, there were a lot of rattlesnakes. Surprisingly, despite it being a, re a fairly rare species, we heard rattlesnakes all around us, and so we had. Coming from a country which has no snakes, it was a little bit terrifying. My field assistant refused to work there. <laughs> we didn't use that side, so we, were, we would have had n equals we would have three sides, but we've only got two. Well, this isn't really about research, but uh, while while do, working on this project, I lived in the small town of Fairplay, Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very unique and interesting place. Um, it's a, a town that's really rich in mining history, and they celebrate that history every summer with their Burrow Days Festival. Mm -hmm. um, and for a few summers, my field assistants and I got a chance to race llamas mm -hmm. on a 5K wow. run through town. <laughs> and uh, you know, if you've ever raced a llama, you know that running with a llama is not an easy um, experience. They they really have minds of their own, and they might stop in the middle of the road. They might go the wrong way. 
Right. And uh, it's it's really an interesting experience, and the town of Fair Play is just a really interesting and fun place to work. So <laughs> I would rec highly recommend that people cool. visit. I don't know if we have any particularly exciting stories since this is an essay review. We were mainly sitting in front of our com computers. <laughs> yeah. One of the studies we reviewed was, was our own study from, um, from Oregon, and we were working mm -hmm. in the Klamath-Siskiyou Mountains. Um, that's the, the study that actually showed at least as great a response on special soils as on normal soils. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a really exciting study because we were using a historical data set collected by Robert Whitaker um, in the 1950s and then going back and resampling those sites. And so that was a really fun exercise um, to try to figure out where um, Whitaker had went and um, sample the, the, the same locations. And a lot of things have changed since that time. A lot of things haven't, but um, doing things like scrambling up road cuts that didn't mm -hmm. used to be there to try to find particular locations um, and you know, sliding down hillsides and things that, <laughs> again, were not there um, in Whitaker's time. You know, I've been trying to think of a, of a good story, and I, I actually, I mean, other than, than an encounter with a crocodile ha that happened while working on this project, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know, it's tough for me to, to think of one. Yeah, I do want to share, though, um, if I may, a neat story uh, re relating to Psychotria is, um, so the two, there, there are many species in the genus, I mean, there are over 2,000 worldwide, but the two anyone would have heard of include one known as the hot lips. This is Psychotria popigiana. And it has an inflorescence, a, a cluster of small flowers that is, are surrounded by two large bracts that have evolved to, uh, dis as, a, as a display for pollinators. And so the, they've converged on the form of a flower petal. So they, they really look like two big red lips. And so the, the plant is iconic for looking like a pair of lips. Um, another one of the species that is really iconic is Psychotria viridis, which is well known for its use in the hallucinogenic brew known as ayahuasca in the western Amazon. So this is really interesting because it contains a drug known as dimethyltryptamine or DMT. And that drug is a hallucinogenic drug, but it's easily broken down by monoamine oxidases. And so if one were just to consume Psychotria viridis, um, it alone, the DMT compound would be broken down and it would never get absorbed into the brain and never re into the bloodstream and never reach the brain. So what the indigenous people in the Western Amazon do is they make a brew in which they mix the roots of Banisteriopsis copy, a malpig vine, with the leaves of Psychotria viridis. And the roots of this Banisteriopsis vine contain a monoamine oxidase inhibitor that prevents those enzymes from breaking down the DMT and so allow it to be fully absorbed. And so I find it really fascinating that they managed to, through trial and error, I presume, figure out this combination. But uh, it's used as a, in their, um, their religious rituals as a hallucinogenic uh, experience. Well, I didn't spend time in the field, but I spent, as I said, a lot of time in, in Herbaria and um, for me, it was quite a privilege to work in, in some of these very old institutes like Kew Botanical Gardens and Quimbra Herbarium. Um, and a highlight was the National History Museum in London, um, mainly because these are uh, institutes where some of the oldest or, or the biologists that have been seminal in, in our modern field of biology have worked. And while I was working at the National History Museum in London, I was sitting in the herbarium, which is in the new part. Um, of the museum called the cocoon and um, part of the novelty of the cocoon is that um, you can actually see scientists at work so I was sitting I was part of the live exhibitions at the National History Museum for a few days the only problem with that was that uh, a lot of the school children that came through would knock on the windows and um, to see me react so I felt a bit like a monkey in a zoo at times yeah I don't have any interesting stories, you know, little things like, um, like my field worker sitting there eating lunch and a, and a, a sloth falling out of a tree and almost landing. You know, you see ostrichs occasionally, which is jaw dropping. Just working in these forests is, is so remarkable that every day you seem to see something where you say, wow, unbelievable, you know. And so interesting stories that, that jump out at me, but it's, it's, um, 
this is a forest with a lot of different animals and there's, there's almost no poaching there. And so you see a lot of animals, there's a lot of interactions going on in this site. So it's a cool place to work, but, um, you know, I didn't see the, you know, the jaguar chasing the deer or anything like that. So 